I'm Liz McDade, a small business owner in Santa Cruz, California, and this is my brother. I'm Paul McDade, an actor and editor working in the TV and film industry here in Los Angeles. And this is Trench Coat, Cigar, Peugeot, Wandering with Columbo. In each episode, we're going to give you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and some behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. Woohoo! And today we're going to be talking about Murder by the Book, which is season one, episode three, or episode one, if you don't count the pilots. And we have a drink and a snack to go with each episode. And this week's drink is champagne. <laughs> Could you hear the, oh, the, yeah. the crack? I heard like I, a ripping sound. <laughs> I have a little screw top individual serving. Which is how much? It's, I think it's five ounces of champagne. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have? have I, on the other hand, have Blanc de Blancs from Trader Joe's and it's a huge bottle. But I won't drink it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll give you a killer headache. Yeah. There's something about champagne that can really, I don't know, for me, can give me a headache. Oh, yeah. No, me too. And then the strawberries and the sugar will get to the famous strawberries with sugar scene. Yeah. But I have some, I actually have some homegrown strawberries, Paul. You do? Yeah. We have a little bitty strawberry plant in our yard. Mm. There were two strawberries. Mm. <laughs> And I had to share them um, with some little bugs, apparently. <laughs> so I cut off the parts that had already been bitten. So I have kind of a measly amount, but they're homegrown. So I'm excited about that. Mm. So you don't usually buy the strawberry plants, you and Elliot, your husband? You mean the strawberries? Strawberries at the store? Yeah. Yeah, you know, we try to avoid plastic package stuff. Yeah. And it can be hard to find strawberries. And But sometimes we'll see them at the store in the little brown boxes that they're using now mm -hmm. that you can recycle. And then also the little green baskets that we, we save when we take them back to the farmers at the farmer's market. So we'll, we will buy strawberries, but just not all the time. And I just decided for today I was going to pick the homegrown ones. Yeah, yeah. Usually at the farmer's market, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, should we talk about Columbo here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I there was some news. So the first episode that we watched, Prescription Murder, I talked a little about the actor Anthony James who played Tommy. Remember, yeah. he was the one who kind of confessed to the murder. Well, he passed away. Mm. He just passed away on... Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, May 26th. He was 77. Wow. So... May 26th, 2020. Yeah, May 26th, 2020. So it was like, I just saw it on probably IMDb, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was like, oh man. We were just talking about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he was a really wonderful performer. Yeah. Yeah, he did a good job. So I have a brief summary for this episode. One half of a writing duo, his name is Ken Franklin, kills his partner, Jim Ferris, because Jim is leaving the writing team and taking his writing skills with him. Franklin tricks his partner to come out to his mountain cabin and call his wife and say he's actually in the office in L.A. and he's going to work late. And then Franklin shoots his partner while he's in the middle of a conversation with his wife. So his wife thinks that he's been killed in his office back in L.A. And a store owner who lives near Franklin's mountain cabin ends up being an indirect witness to this crime. And Franklin ends up killing her, too. And Columbo, of course, is suspicious from the very start. And he ends up digging through the team's notes, the writing team's sort of files, to finally get the evidence to lock this guy up. Yeah. So first scene here is a car, Franklin's fancy, I think it's a Mercedes. Yeah, it's a Mercedes. Driving down Sunset Boulevard towards a really tall office building. And you hear the sounds of a typewriter going. And this office has a really cool view of Sunset Boulevard. And I was looking around on Google Maps. It looks like this building is still there on Sunset Boulevard. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, there's some old ones that are still up for sure. Yeah. 
and we see the parking garage. I just wanted to say, Paul, this parking ramp reminded me of a short that you did. It pro- you probably didn't oh, yeah? do it at the same spot, but there didn't you do a short film with, and you were like on a parking ramp, maybe the Mazda MX-6 RIP little old red car was in the, <laughs> in the film with you. Something I made? I thought so. Maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, were you in it? Did I, did I put you in, in the short film? No, no. Uh-uh. I'm not in it. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I had the Mazda in, in a TV show called The Unusual Suspects, where I played a real life killer. But we I don't remember parking lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. But never mind. maybe. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> don't be sorry yeah okay well we this is the first scene we meet ken franklin and jim ferris and ken franklin is played by jack cassidy and i thought that jack cassidy does a really good job of being like super charming in this first scene he opens the door with a gun pointed at his partner and then his partner starts laughing he knows it's a joke but then ken franklin is sort of like plays plays a little bit, I don't know, not bashful, but like a little bit regretful and saying he, you know, he wants to apologize for getting upset about him leaving the writing team. Mm-hmm. And I thought he did a good job of being like a charming kind of slimy kind of guy. Yeah. Well, the gun in the face, that's a little much. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that was that's pretty creepy. That was creepy. Yeah. But I guess he did it with enough humor so to speak or fake acting to his buddy that his friend you know his writing partner knew that it wasn't for real yeah just the way he delivered it totally i just want to point out about this office other than the really beautiful windows that get all this great light the set decorating was really impressive there were tons of cool props like little animal skulls or large yeah animal skulls this weird like globe kind of like wooden sculpture thing and the painting of Mrs. Melville, who's the fictional heroine of this writing team. So I thought the office was cool. Yeah, no, it was in the like picture of Newsweek and posters of their books. And it seems like, yeah, this is be like a really cool office to do, you know, your writing. Totally. I always feel like a lot of writers would probably be home though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or like in some cabin or, but I don't know. You know, I don't, this is, yeah. So William Link and Richard Levinson, they are a writing team. They didn't write this one though. Stephen Bochco did, if that's how you pronounce his name. He, who was really famous, almost as famous as Spielberg. Well, maybe not almost as famous as Spielberg. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to be as famous as Spielberg. Yeah. Yeah. He's not as famous. Yeah, do you want to talk about the fact that Spielberg directed this episode? I don't know if you if you looked at any of that background. Yeah, it was a fun episode for sure. And he, 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 I think he, Spielberg definitely brought, I'm sure. I saw an interview or read an interview with him, with Steven Spielberg, and he said a long time ago, but he said something like working in television taught him so much, but it was like a sweat factory. You know, you worked your butt off. This was very hard, but he said he learned so much, though, because it's like you were forced to make quick decisions. I felt like the close-ups were very unique and and reminded me of, and like the the people talking, like when, when when they find the body in the lake and you see real, looks like real police officers and it's like a far away long shot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of truth to life detail. It felt like that Spielberg and his team kind of brought to this episode along with a lot of other things. But the camera guy, Russell Meddy, he's, he did a few Columbo's. I don't know how many, but I watched some of his work. I, he did Madigan for Universal with Don Siegel. Mm-hmm. Madigan was great. It had real locations. And he also did The Omega Man with Charlton Heston, which is a really pretty entertaining film. Really well done. Still kind of holds up. I saw that as a kid when we lived in Munich hmm. and it really scared me, but it still it still holds up pretty well. It's done, been done like three times, that story. It's a Richard Matheson story who's kind of like Stephen King a little bit for, for t- television and just in general. Okay. Horror. What did you think of Spielberg? Yeah, I thought I definitely felt like there was somebody with a little more vision, like behind the ca- the the camera or, you know, behind the sort of directing things, I guess. It just felt like he made a lot more decisions about like, oh, we're going to shoot this from like a 
lower angle and we're going to have this scene. We're going to have like people crossing in front of the camera and Mm -hmm. yeah, it it was cool. I liked it. I thought it, it gave it more, it gave it a, a good feeling of sort of, putting you there, having, having more of those realistic touches so that it feels more like you're there in the moment with the, with the story. Mm-hmm. There was a series called The Name of the Game, which I may have mentioned before, and it had Gene Barry, who we know as, you know, Richard Levinson and William Link wrote a lot of stuff that he happened to act in. And Gene Barry uh, was in The Name of the Game. And The Name of the Game had three different actors and each actor would carry their own story. So it sort of rotate between these characters, but Gene Barry was one of them. And I think the name of the game and even uh, Noam Chomsky's uncle, I think was a, was uh, someone who worked on it as a director. I forget his full name, but Stephen Bochco also was a writer for the name of the game, just like Richard Levinson and William Link. But the finale for the name of the game was season three and Gene Barry was the star but Spielberg directed it, and it was called Los Angeles 2017. Huh. And you can watch this online. And Gene Barry, who plays like a magazine mogul, and he, he's kind of a, he's a, you like him. He's a good guy. It feels like I've only seen one episode, and I, and I saw part of this episode. But it's Los Angeles in the future, right? Oh, this, cool. Because it came out in the 70s, this show. Yeah. Or even the 60s, maybe. I, I'm not sure right around there but uh gene barry's and and it's i started to watch it It was really good and i was like you know i want to watch this at another time but it was very it had like epic feeling to it because it was los angeles in the future and it's like gene barry wakes up somehow he has fallen asleep or he he's like rip van winkle right so he wakes up 30 years into the future but hasn't aged and so there's all this futuristic stuff i guess spielberg snuck onto the universe a lot when he was younger and I'm sure everybody, a lot of people who listen to these kinds of stories, they know this frontwards and backwards. I don't know it. <laughs> but he, I believe he's, yeah, he's, he snuck onto the lot and um, somehow met one of the main producers or something of Universal and they gave him a chance at some stuff, you know, or, her, or he worked his way up, and, you know, very quickly. Uh, something along those lines, but he wasn't supposed to be there, basically. Yeah. Um, no one asked him. <laughs> no one was interviewing him. Right. Incredibly, he did that, you know, because he ended up doing so much television for Universal at that point. And then, of course, you know, the rest was history. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say something. Oh, I saw in some of the trivia, IMDb trivia about this episode, that this was one of the first, one of a f- couple of first few things that Spielberg did before he started to get more offers or more opportunities, I guess. Oh. That these guys kind of took a little bit of a chance on him. Mm. And they, I guess they saw the the skill that he had and... Yeah, just let him kind of do his thing, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. The first actor to play Columbo was Burt Freed. We talked about him. Uh-huh. And he was in the that television show. I forget the name of the series. It was like the Craft Hour or something like that. And it was Prescription Murder, and he played Columbo. But he was in Madigan, the movie I just mentioned. He he, he was a, he, very different, very more stern, but good a good actor. Incidentally, he played a detective, another detective in a movie called Detective Story, which had Lee Grant, who was in the other episode we saw oh, wow. as the killer. And he, I think he arrests her, but they're in the, in the, I saw a picture of them together in the police precinct. And that's what, and when Lee Grant won the best actress at Cannes Film Festival for that role. Oh, wow. Cool. Small world. Yep. Yep. Maybe that was a universal thing too. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not yeah. though. Cause Lee, Lee Grant didn't work for a while after that, but maybe uh-huh. it was. All right. So we, we, we meet these two. Ken Franklin convinces his partner to come up to his cabin. He says it's in San Diego. It's only a couple hours away. And so they walk out of the office building together. And then when they get to the car, Ken says, oh, I, I left my lighter back in the office. I need yeah. to go back and get it. And Jim's like, okay, I'll wait in the car. And so when Ken goes back, he ransacks the office and makes it look like something has happened in the office. He's sort of setting the scene for his diabolical murder plan. Mm-hmm. 
But I did want to make one fashion comment here. Jim is wearing these super cool gray suede short boots. Oh, yeah. And they have, I don't know if you noticed these, but they were in style in the 70s. And then I feel like they made a, they were in style in the 80s too. But they had like this raised seam around the toe that kind of went, like kind of wrapped around the side of the shoe and around the toe. Oh, yeah. I see it. Like just a couple holes, couple skinny holes for, or a couple holes for skinny laces. And oh, they, I had I had a pair of those. I had yeah. two different pairs of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are great. Those are so cool. I've always loved those. Yeah, they might have been called Earth Shoes when this came out. Like that might have been the company that was generally making them. But I know, okay, probably like tons of companies who make them now. Anyhow, I just noticed those really nice light gray. I like those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, those are those are I always like those. I, I still have a pair actually. Nice. Well, you gotta take a picture of that too, Paul. Put it on the, <laughs> okay. Add that to the Instagram. Oh sure, Jack Cassidy, who plays Ken Franklin. I love his corduroy jacket. Oh yeah, he's super stylish. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he's so stylish. Yeah, with that ring on his yeah pinky his pinky ring. Yes, I love it. Big he's gold. He's fierce. Pinky. Yeah. All right. So Ken trashes the office. Then he they get in the car and they head up to his cabin in San Diego, which is actually in Big Bear. Yeah. Yeah. And which is also a couple hour drive from L.A. Have you ever been to Big Bear, Paul? Yes, I have. I've been there at least three times. Nice. What do you remember about it? What what's like stands out to you about Big Bear? Well, they have a big lake, which they show in the episode. They do have an inlet of the river of from the lake i think that's connected to like the little if you want to call it downtown where all the little shops are and that the last time i went there was just completely empty because of the drought oh wow yeah another time we went up there when it was really cold and snowy well there's a really bad accident someone had been drinking and oh no yeah the really someone died i think sad that said we we had a great time like sledding oh fun with the kids we, yeah, we went with some friends and they had like a log cabin type place, but it had heat and running water and all that stuff. Yeah. So it just the exterior was probably like synthetic, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Pretend. I can't rem- oh. Yeah. It was, we enjoyed both times that we went, or I, th- I want to say we went three times, but it was, it's real nice. I mean, for us, it's always great to just get away, but yeah, Big Bear is very popular. Yeah, I bet. I've never been there, but it looks so beautiful from this Colombo. Um, and then I was looking around, I was poking around online trying to find where that little country store was. And it looks like it was at this spot called Juniper Point Picnic, but it, it was removed. It was like a well-known old building and it was torn down. Oh, okay. It looks like about 15 years ago. It wasn't actually a store. Oh, I think they just turned it into a store. I wasn't able to find a ton of info. But in this scene, we meet Miss Lasenka, who oh, yeah. is like my favorite person in this episode. Me too. She was awesome. And she's wearing this gorgeous white blouse that's like covered with embroidered colorful flowers like up on the chest and the sleeves. It's like very bohemian, very like 70s style. Ken Franklin hands her a book, Prescription Murder, which is the name of the pilot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that little like nod. Yeah. And she gives him his groceries to take to the cabin. He insists that he's alone, even though, you know, he's got Jim in the car. Mm -hmm. He parks pretty far back. Yeah. He like, he goes through the front and then, or to the side and then keeps going and keeps going. He's trying to be sneaky for sure. Yeah. But she, I love the, like seeing food from different eras. I don't know why. I just find it so interesting. But one of the things that she puts in his box of groceries is a loaf of bread that's just like loose you know it's not bagged or anything and it looks really yummy it's like a delicious loaf of bread it looks like a bagel like a huge bagel <laughs> this is like a giant bagel yeah uh yeah the store looked pretty good like they looked like they had some good stuff yeah totally i was getting i was getting a little hungry there were all these like bags of potato chips and stuff and candy. <laughs> yeah my, one of my one of my uh, boys saw, saw that and he's like oh look at all the candy <laughs> he just walked in he didn't watch the episode but yeah. Oh, my kids have been, Hazel and Bee have been really loving Columbo's lately. Oh, cool. Yeah. They were like, which one are you going to talk about tonight? The one with the, where the writing guy kills the other writing guy? I was like, yep. That's <laughs> so the next scene is at the cabin 
I also tried to find where this cabin was. It said online, it says it's on Deer Trail Lane, but I couldn't really see if the building was still there or not, but it's definitely a street in Big Bear with probably amazing views of the lake, just like the cabin. Yeah, it's it's a lot more, there's like neighborhoods. We had friends who own a place up there. I forgot, yeah, we, we stayed with them for a couple days and they had a place kind of similar, not on the lake, but uh, really nice. And they were up against the mountains and we there's like a quarry back there. Oh, like a, cool. that was like a, yeah, some sort of a mining court. And they have like a shooting range nearby as well. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. I imagine it's a lot more developed than, you know, when they filmed this up there. Yeah. So Jim and Ken are, are at the cabin and Jim decides to call his wife and Ken's like, just, you know, little white lie. So <laughs> she's not, she's not worried about you and you can hang out with me. Ken has put plastic down on his sofa, which is so creepy. And then that's, well, that was kind of common too, though, right? I think so. Okay. But you're right. Probably it was just for him. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was like some creepy criminal planning, you know, but. Um, no, you're right. It doesn't look like the regular plastic I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Definitely like, yeah, this is where you're going to die, buddy. Ugh. Uh, so, yeah, so that's where he dies, sitting down on the sofa, talking with his wife. And then she just, you know, panics, of course. You know, it's, it's kind of cool. They like cut out some of the stuff that must have gone on. And it's just the next scene is back in the office. The wife is there. There's tons of cops around. It's nighttime. Oh, yeah. Or I don't know. It's, it looks like it's much darker out. Yeah, it is. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to say about the cabin or the big bear scenes there, Paul? Uh, just interesting how this type of thing, you know, murder happens all the time. I've never really followed true crime, although I have some books about it. But it's interesting that his partner, I mean, this is a work of fiction, but that his partner doesn't have, you can, he, he seems that the actor himself seems agitated. I thought Jim. Yeah, Jim, played by Martin Milner, Jim Ferris. So it's really, he's really well cast. Incidentally, he played, he was in Adam 12, and he was in the Dragnet series as a, as a police, L.A. Police Department. Oh. I kind of feel like he is sort of registering that an uncomfortableness, but he doesn't see it coming. So like the idea that this guy would kill him just doesn't register at all. Yeah. Like he just never saw it coming, right? Totally. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, there are people that would, would do that. I don't know. I just, this is a good scene. That guy's a really good actor. Yeah. I thought he was really good too. He was really convincing. Yeah. He seemed like a good guy. Like, like totally. the, he seemed like the good guy on the whole team. Totally. He's like <laughs> the one you want to hang out with. The yeah. Want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not the other guy. Maybe I'd hang out with Jack Cassie. I don't know. It sounds like he was, uh, he suffered from uh, bipolar Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. I would go see, so I would want to hang out with Jim Ferris, have a beer or go on a hike. And then I would want to watch Jack Cassidy, you know, do something on the stage because he's just such a performer. Yeah. Not someone I'd want to hang out with, but someone I definitely like to watch perform. Yeah, no, he probably, I could see him confiding in me information that I didn't want to (laughs) hear about people that surround us, you know. Oh, totally. Like, Don't tell me. <laughs> ah, totally. Well, the scene back at the office, we meet, well, I guess we, I think we might have met the wife, Mrs. Ferris. I can't remember her first name, but here she is in this beautiful classic color blocking outfit, like solid red clothes with a purple vest mm-hmm. and a long chain there's tons of cops the air fit you just sort of feel like when i was watching it i was like oh man it's so smoky and hot like i gotta get out of this room she's feeling that way too and colombo finds her in the hallway where she's trying to get some water he takes her he convinces her like let me take you home you can come back and you know tell the cops more as needed or whatever yeah and then, so then they go back to their house and this is like classic seventies home. It's got blue, baby blue cabinets and olive green appliances. I love it. And Colombo makes an omelet, which I love also. Yeah. So her costume, which is the, it's the same person, Burton Miller, right? Mm-hmm. He did something like that for Omen 2 Damien, which we've mentioned a couple times. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Omen 2 Damien. <laughs> 
actress Elizabeth Shepard plays Joan Hart. She wears this bright red jacket with this fluffy collar that's red. And she gets attacked by crows, these these evil, menacing crows. Ah. Uh, but her, her outfit is so, it stands out in the film. I watched yeah. Omen 2 with Lee Grant, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's who right. Who was super good in it. But it's a pretty creepy movie. But yeah, Rosemary Forsyth plays Joanna Ferris. Oh, Joanna. That's that's her name. Yeah. And she's pretty interesting. I didn't know who she was. And so I looked at some of her work besides this. She was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. She's still, like, I think she only stopped working recently. Like 2017, maybe. Wow. Yeah, but she did a film called, I watched this film called Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice. Mm-hmm. And it was with Geraldine Page and Ruth Gordon. Ah, I know Gordon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it, she's the third person in, in top billing is Rosemary Forsyth. And she plays this neighbor in Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice. And that was a great movie, by the way. Cool. If you want to see a kind of a horror tension film with... Oh, I, I can't do horror tension films. With it's it's not bloody too you know or anything. I mean, there's a couple scenes, but uh, you want to see two heavyweight performers go at it: Ruth Gordon and Geraldine Page. So good. It was like Lawrence Olivier and Uta Hagen in Boys from Brazil, or Marlon Brando and I forget the bad guy's name in Fugitive Kind. It was like it's just two great actors. Yeah. It's it's like uh, Peter Falk and Jack Cassidy. Yeah. So yeah, and I watched another one she did called Black Eye that was pretty interesting. It wasn't nearly as good as Aunt Alice, but it was very entertaining. So, but yeah, she's a very interesting actress. I, I in the Alice one, she was very emotional. But uh, yeah, I'd like to see more of her work to see her her range. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I don't. I haven't seen her or heard of her in anything else. What did you think of her? in this i thought she was okay i think she did a good job at showing like a range of emotions experiences or whatever i don't know i guess that there were a couple times where i wasn't completely feeling her what she was trying to convey like i felt a little bit of like a little jarring or something like when like in the last second to last scene she and colombo kind of go at it a little bit Mm-hmm. I don't know. There was just a moment there where it, I, I just, I mean, she, I thought she did fine, but I wasn't like blown away. Yeah. Yeah. No, St. John, my wife, she watched this with me and she felt like she should have been more distraught over her husband missing. And she, she like, she was in that opening scene, but she felt like she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't st- strong enough to say that. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of sort of how I felt too, that like, yeah, not quite enough behind how she was conveying things i guess i don't know Mm -hmm. i mean and other thing is that the character miss lasenka lily lasenka is so good that it's really i think she kind of you know the the joanna ferris pales in comparison to lily yeah lily is really amazing she's so good incidentally her sister renee colby i don't know like renee i don't know what her last name is but she runs a facebook page in honor of Barbara Colby. Oh, cool. There's so much really interesting things about Barbara. Because when Renee, she was, I think, her half-sister or something like that. But she, but Renee has said that it was like, she was like a mentor to her. And mm-hmm. she came out to Los Angeles and New York, I think, with uh, Barbara at different times, just oh, visiting. Okay. But but yeah. she uh, everybody had really good things to say about Barbara Colby. But the, the strange thing is that Barbara Colby was shot in real life at age 36. So she died very shortly after this movie was made. I don't know if you looked at her. I saw that. Her IMDb page. So sort of unusual. Yeah. Yeah. That's super sad. I saw that, that she was killed. And I saw that it's actually still an unsolved case. Like they still don't know Mm -hmm. who did it or why. Like it wasn't a clear, it wasn't a robbery. I just read a little blip somewhere. Yeah, they were coming out of acting. Yeah. They had taught an acting class, her and another person who also got shot. Yeah, her, my, her boyfriend, maybe. If you go online, you can see a couple of different ideas about it, but who knows? Yeah, super sad. Yeah, because she's so talented. When I, when I was doing research on her, there's all kinds of things you know you can find. Her sister, Renee, said that regarding the crime, all of us believe it was fate for her and random to the world. And when she said that, it was kind of like, Part of Barbara's beliefs were she's very practicing spiritual person with different, I forget the name of one of the 
people that she followed, but she was very interested in different things and different cultures. So different religions, you know? Yeah. I don't know all the specifics, but more of like, say, the Pueblo Indians, maybe maybe not the Pueblo Indians, but something like that. Yeah. And so because Renee knew her so well, she mentioned that at the funeral, I believe. So it was just kind of interesting to think about. So regarding the crime, all of us believe it was fate for her and ran him to the world. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty serious, but at the same time, you know, a lot of people, she, she touched a lot of people, obviously. Yeah. Cause yeah, she was so funny and truthful and, you know, she wanted to be with this crazy guy, Jack Cassidy in, yeah. the, in the show. Oh my goodness. And she's, yeah, I can't say enough good things about yeah, she, watching her. She was amazing. I have some more notes when we get to on her when we get to a little later. Okay, so Columbo takes Joanna home, makes her an omelet, which is kind of fun to watch. And then he can Columbo meets Ken Franklin. Franklin is so so I don't know, not as slimy the word. He has all these little digs at Columbo. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. The first time they meet, he's like, oh, I, you know, who's Mrs. Melville? That's my detective. She's, you could learn a lot, Columbo. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reading my, <laughs> my books or whatever. Anyhow, so Columbo meets the, the murderer, and, and I think he's, you know, the, the gears are turning in Columbo's head. He's on to this guy right away. Franklin takes Columbo to the office gives him a list of names and tells Columbo he thinks that this was a hired hit because Jim was turning to more serious writing. Columbo's like, oh, wow, okay, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Just sort of played along. It's kind of his blind spot, too, Ken Franklin's, because it's, he's kind of like an idiot. <laughs> yes. You know, in a lot of ways, he's so, like, he's he's obviously devious and intelligent, but at the same time, him saying that kind of stuff to like a police officer mm -hmm. it's like it shows you like how blind he is to his own like inflated mind mm -hmm. of who he is who he thinks yeah. he is totally right yeah i think he portrays like a super arrogant person very well <laughs> <laughs> Does a good job. Well, the next scene, we Franklin goes returns to his home and he p places his dead writing partner of how many years I don't even know. puts his body on his front yard, calls the police. It's like Columbo needs to get here right away. There's something for you, you know, something for you to see. And of course, I went on a little. I went down a rabbit hole on this house. <laughs> which was actually so. So this original building was torn down about ten years ago. Oh. Yeah. It's featured in another Columbo called Exercise in Fatality. Hmm. Which in a later season. Okay. But this address, so someone bought it. I was trying to follow the, the trail. Somebody bought it, tore it down, and they they built a house named The One, which is a ninety nine nine hundred and ninety nine thousand square foot home with seventeen bedrooms, <laughs> twenty five bathrooms, three or four swimming pools, four stories. Whoa. Yeah, and supposedly so it's in in Bel Air on Air Role Way. And supposedly they it was put on the market for like five hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. But that's about as much as I could find about it. I saw the owner who was rebuilding this crazy massive home created a YouTube video of his architect's virtual drawing of the home. Mm -hmm. The architect did or whoever created like a virtual tour of the house, which is it's all like drawn, right? It's not like it's not like a realtor's virtual tour you might see on a website. It's like an all drawn, like a artist's rendering of the of the building. Yeah. So I don't know exactly where it's. I think it's. I'm pretty sure it's finished now, but I haven't seen um, photos of the actual finished building. Did they use the same door? That leaf door? I don't know. Oh man, I doubt it. Isn't that so cool? Yeah, that was really pretty. Yeah, in a later scene, we get an even better view of it, but it has these really tall windows that are basically floor to ceiling and like a two story room, floor to ceiling windows with the view of the city. Super pretty. So even at that in that at that time, this was probably like an amazing house, even though now it's been like quadrupled and bedrooms and bathrooms and whatnot. Anyhow, so the cops show up, Columbo shows up and he sees that Ken Franklin opened his mail while he was 
Mm-hmm. Talking to the cops. So this is another clue to Columbo about, you know, Ken Franklin's guilt, basically. Yeah. The next scene is at the tail of the pup, which is the cutest little hot dog stand you ever did see. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's still here, I think, isn't it? No, I, I went on another deep dive oh. on the tail of the pup. It was featured in six other shows. Well, they stopped doing it, though, huh? Yeah. So it was in Body Double, a movie with car. Okay, yeah, Brian De Palma. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sorry, Melanie Griffith. That's the name I, I recognize. Thank God it's Friday, 1978. I think I saw that in the theater when I was a kid. Did you? <laughs> so cool. I think so. Don't remember anything about uh, it. It's in a two-minute short video called Buck Owens Hot Dog from 1988, starring Buck Owens. Huh. It's in the Rockford Files in one episode. It's in Adam 12 in one episode. And then supposedly it's in an Anthony Bourdain's A Cook's Tour episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like this was a TV show documentary. Anyhow, that's cool. But now, so the Tale of the Pup hot dog stand um, was part of a trend, I guess, of buildings small buildings being built in the shape of the product or of the food. I think I saw like a tamale stand. Oh yeah. The shape of a tamale. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, what I saw, I didn't do a ton of research, but what I saw is that the tail of the pup is now in a museum. And I think it looked like somebody was hoping oh. to restore it and reopen it somewhere at some point. But I think it's, I don't think it's open anywhere. I mean, obviously like almost nothing is open right now, but I think that's still in a museum. Yeah. Yeah. I'd seen it before. Oh yeah. That stand. Yeah. I I must've seen it in the, um, could have been the Rockford files. I've watched some of those, but I've definitely seen it before in a movie or television show. Very cool. I've only seen it in this Columbo. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Well, the next scene is at the movie theater and Ken Franklin is on a date with a beautiful young woman. Mm -hmm. He's being his arrogant self again. (laughs) And she's like, oh my goodness, what did you think of that movie? And he's like, oh, I had it figured out from the very beginning. (laughs) He's the worst. He's so bad. And she's like, oh, you must have a devious mind. And he's like, no, I don't know what he says. (laughs) But I I wanted to point out his date looks amazing. She has this long, like full length lavender silky robe, and she has a lavender feather boa. She just looks spectacular. Yeah, I love that boa, and she's carrying this little sleek silver clutch. It's just a little bit. It's like a purse. It's just a little bit bigger than a sunglass case. And Ken looks pretty nice too. He has a black pinstripe suit on with a matching vest that you can see. He's wearing a silky black and gold tie and a baby blue shirt. He looks pretty good. Yeah, and like you said, this was Burton Miller on costumes again for this episode. Yeah, and did you? And her outfit's red too. Oh, Lily. Yes. Barbara yes. Colby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all red. It's like stark red. You see it. You see her outside the theater before they come down the stairs. Yeah, totally. You don't. You don't know it's her, but then then you see her again. Did you find out what theater that was? No, I tried so hard, Paul. I probably spent like thirty minutes trying to find this theater. Oh. So this theater is. I was. I'm not an architect. I don't know the models, the designs, but I wanted to say it was maybe like Art Deco era. It had these a lot of shapes kind of coming out of the walls and of the ceiling, like kind of ornate. Mm-hmm. but kind of modern at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I tried really hard to find out what theater it was. And I was looking online at all the cool theaters. You guys in L.A. have a ton of really beautiful historic theater buildings. Oh, man. Amazing yeah. history of different theaters. Yeah, I could not. I, maybe I'll try harder. And maybe for next episode, I'll I'll know which one it was. But I was looking like, is this the war? I saw like Warner, the Warner Grand Theater is kind of has the Art Deco style. The Landmark, there's a Landmark New Art Theater also has some art is like Art Deco style. But yeah, I couldn't I could not figure out which one it was. So there's a website called the Columbo File. Probably anyone mm-hmm. listening to this has heard of this website, but they have a map of filming locations but i couldn't find it on there but i'll look harder (laughs) i'm not gonna give up i really want to know where that was filmed yeah because i might have been i might have worked there before really or or been in there yeah i worked at a theater 
Maybe maybe it's not that one though, because that one's so ornate. Yeah, it has. So what? What I kind of was freezing the frame and looking up, and it had these like white squiggly lines along the ceiling, and then it has you know like the frames that hold the movie posters. Yeah, they were like white frames with these like three sort of seashell shapes coming up along the top edge of the frame. Mm-hmm. And then the movie poster was inside. There was a staircase that came down that kind of looked like the Warner Theater staircase, but then the ceilings and the walls didn't really match the Warner Theater. So, yeah, I don't know. It was really pretty. So I was thinking maybe even the Ricardo Montalban Theater. It could have been something on Universal. Yeah, that's true. It could have not actually been a theater. But I typed in Ricardo Montalban, 1970. I mean, it was something else before that. It's like a little treasure, treasure, <laughs> treasure hunt, trying to figure out like. I've done different research for different things, and and gone into looking at some old photographs of old theaters because they, you know they've gone through multiple changes. They'll turn into jewelry stores downtown, or they'll. They'll turn into places where people go preaching, you know, from the 30s to the 50s, and then it'll become a movie theater again. Or it'll, you know, it's like there's all these different venues, or then, or then it becomes a music hall that new upcoming bands will play at. It's not a theater anymore. So there's various locations all over Los Angeles that go through these multiple lives in a way. Yeah. It's really interesting to think about. I could imagine. Lots going on there in L.A. Mm -hmm. Oh, so when I was looking at the costume designer, I also saw that the theme song for this episode was written by Henry Mancini. Mancini. Or Mancini. Henry Mancini. Yeah, yeah. I was looking like he had already won an Oscar for his composing on Breakfast at Tiffany's, Moon River, Uh when he composed for this song. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's kind of these guys, William Link and Richard Levinson, they must have had some quite a number of connections to get all these like big names on their show. Yeah. Yeah. TV was such a big thing and, you know, was created to compete with film. But if you had Universal, who did both, yeah. they wanted it to be good. The theme in this one is has the, the typewriters going, like you're writing. It's like, oh, it sounds like typing. Yeah. Ting, 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 ting. I didn't even ting. think of that. Yeah, it has this whole, but the, yeah, the typewriter sound, is, I really liked it. Like it, it kind of co- goes and comes and goes. When I first watched this episode, or again, because I, I remember this one. I'd seen it a long time ago. Oh, okay. I think I watched it either at your house or you lent lent it to me or something. Oh, I, I made you watch it. No, no. I <laughs> I was at your place. I remember one holiday where I wanted to just watch Columbo's, and I think I watched a ton of them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the music was yeah the, pretty top notch. Yeah, so it's the same thing, like I said, with Walter Meddy, who did the cinematography. He was doing big movies and stuff for Universal. He may he may have uh, been nominated for something. He probably was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Henry Mancini did uh, maybe most well known for the Pink Panther mm-hmm. theme song. Yeah. People don't the breakfast. That Pink Panther theme song is just like that has permeated our culture still to this day. It pops up and I feel like it pops up all the time. Yeah. That's a good one. But yeah, so Lily Lasenka wearing the lots of red, blazing red. In the red restaurant. <laughs> In the red restaurant. Where they have the strawberries. It's all red. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one thing before we leave the theater. I don't know if you saw this, Paul, but she gets Franklin to come to her. She's she's so good here. She's like yeah. jumping up and down, Mr. Franklin. Like yeah. she's just like this red siren of electricity in there. But anyhow, she gets Franklin to come over to her. I don't know if you saw this, but right next to her is a couple making out. Did you see that? So the two of them are like having this conversation and right next to her, two people are kissing very passionately, like right in the middle of the screen. When he's talking to Lily? Yeah, in the theater. Uh, It's so bizarre. Yeah, that's the director, I guess. Or the second the second. Yeah. second assistant director yeah it's funny but you could see there when he she's like telling him about you know i i have this information i know certain thing i have an idea or whatever she says Mm -hmm. they he uh spielberg and walter meddy they get really close to their faces super close yeah like he did that with columbo and ken franklin when they first meet each other in the in the bathroom yeah 
But what, totally. but when she wants to keep him there, she grabs his hand and the camera's right on her, super close up and then right on him. And it almost has the anamorphic feel to it. Yeah. The look of their faces with their nose big and, and she's like, I don't want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> she's so good here. She convinces him. Yeah, I love her red outfit, like red gloves even. It's just awesome. Okay, yeah, so the next scene is at a restaurant with red walls, like you said, at a big bowl of ice with juicy red strawberries and i also went down a little bit of a deep dive trying to figure out what restaurant this was it's not on the not on a map of colombo filming locations it's not in imdb so i don't know if i'll ever be able to find out but it has these cool it's like the walls were red wallpaper with stripes vertical stripes of like different shades of red maybe there was like a little yellow or something but very classy 70s class Mm -hmm. you know and then these like cool candlestick light fixtures up on the walls it was like very romantic sort of setting but also scary too if you think of (laughs) yeah but it could go both ways i guess especially in the 70s yeah yeah there's a film called the cook the thief his wife and her lover do you know that one Uh uh-huh yeah yeah so i think i watched that with you probably (laughs) well the 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 production person and the camera person sacha vierne and i forget the name of the production person i think that's the camera operator but there's these scenes like this that just everything's red but but also the like Mm. ken franklin would be wearing something red as well you know yeah but this is has that kind of feel because you got strawberries you got the red dress and it's like just red wood yeah. everywhere red rug it's all red yeah yeah it's pretty cool yeah so this is our snack have you tasted your strawberries with oh. with sugar yet Mom? yeah yeah i've been eating it's really good oh i want to try it i'm gonna have a little bit i haven't yeah no i couldn't wait i was like i i waited for that chili last time i'm not gonna wait for it mm. now oh man don't wait yeah oh yeah i had to wait because i only have like two little tiny morsels but so lily is eating strawberries dipped in sugar and i am having a bite of that right now Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so good so they're they're drinking dessert wine they're sipping their dessert wine these cute little glasses little like vintage you know dessert wine super short glasses and lily's really enjoying her strawberries with sugar and yeah this was another scene where she i thought i just thought she was amazing she was so good mm-hmm. i don't know I, just, I didn't write any i was like trying to I, I have some notes on like how she did later but in this scene she's just so convincing that she like she's so good-hearted and like really cares about Ken Franklin but at the same time she's like this is an opportunity for me to yeah you know turn my life around or whatever she's just really convincing and this so good yeah she she because she, obviously she likes him but then we find out later that it's more than just that obviously but yeah she gets him to smile and like kind of laugh she has sort of this personality and and he also knows that yeah. Well, he thinks that he can just, you know, that she's not that big of a threat. Right. I think what it was here is that she felt so authentic. She cares about him so much. And then he's staring or she's like infatuated with him, I should say. Like she doesn't really know him well, yeah. well enough to truly care about him. But she's just like enamored of him. And he's staring at her and she, and her reaction is like, your stare is so intense. And it's just, yeah. she just feels like so genuine and like and open and i don't know just like her everything is just right out in front for her she doesn't hold back yeah she wants to believe she wants to believe that he loves her yeah i mean and she lets him feed him her that strawberry (laughs) that's crazy she's kind of like uh the lady in misery a little bit Uh uh-huh she's sweeter obviously but (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah she doesn't quite uh she doesn't turn the tables on him (laughs) at all yeah Really good job. So, okay, so maybe we should mention in this scene, she, you know, she tells him what she knows and asks for $15,000 and she feels awful. She like knocks her drink over while she's asking for it Mm -hmm. and he agrees. So she's going to stay silent that she saw her, his partner, Jim, in the car at the country store parking lot and Ken's going to bring her $15,000. And then we move on to the next day. Ken Franklin's at his house getting interviewed and Columbo shows up with a huge stack of books that were written by Ken Franklin and Jim Ferris that are all of Mrs. Melville novels. So he was like, you got to read these, Columbo. You'll get smart. If you read my books, you can yeah. you know, solve, solve mystery. Just <laughs> <is> hilarious. <laughs> so Col- Oh, it's so funny. Which shows you he wasn't much of the writer. Yeah. Gosh. 
So Columbo shows up with like each arm full of books and Ken's getting interviewed by a journalist. Columbo kind of it interrupts a little bit. I just want to point out the journalist's outfit. Is- <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. She has this like felted short brim plum colored hat that she's wearing kind of like a little bit to the side, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of cocked a little bit, <laughs> cocked a little bit. And this, thick silver chain with like really big loops around it Mm -hmm. and a big matching plum colored feather accessory on the hat. (laughs) Love it. And then she has a matching plum colored choker Yeah, and a matching plum colored blouse. She even has a matching plum colored purse and she's wearing a white skirt suit so like a a little coat suit coat and then a skirt and these tall white leather boots yeah anyhow she looks spectacular yeah and she's interviewing ken she's like talking about the death of the part his partner and he shows his sliminess here particularly Mm -hmm. with the journalists and we get a better view of of the of the home because it's daytime now and we get to see the amazing view out the windows the interview wraps up and columbo returns the books and he's just kind of fall i think you know he's just trying to keep close tabs on franklin because he's so suspicious at this point and he sees that franklin has two bottles of champagne and he's like are you going you must be going with somebody Mm -hmm. to your cabin and he's like oh no i can drink that all by myself (laughs) (laughs) and so columbo sees him off or whatever from his home and then we get back to the country store so franklin has left his home and drove up to the country store to see Mrs. Lasenka. He brings her, you know, he's got the briefcase with the cash and he brings her the briefcase. This is another point where she was so amazing. So the scene here, she's standing in the country store behind the counter, but she has an awesome view from behind the counter out to the parking lot, out to the lake. Mm-hmm. Sees Ken pull in to the parking mm-hmm. lot and her, the look on her face is that like all of my dreams are about to come true Mm -hmm. like i can't even believe what's happening to me right she has that like joy it just she just conveys it so convincingly in that moment while she's just while she's watching him she's not even in there she's just watching him park his car Mm -hmm. and her look is like oh it's so good yeah it's really really good and ken comes in brings her the money and asks her to make dinner for them that night and she agrees to. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to say about that scene with her, Paul, where she's like... Yeah. No, I just looked at it again. Yeah, she's so great. She looks like she's tearing up almost. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, yeah, superb acting. Yeah, so good. Really impressive. It's cool. It's really cool. You know, I am like love Columbo. I've seen every Columbo. I think every, maybe not some of the most, some of the later ones, but like the early ones, I've seen at least two or three times just because I love them and I'll have them like playing in the background while I'm making dinner or something. Mm -hmm. But when I watched this episode so that we could talk about it, I feel like I really got so much more out of. Like, I appreciated her performance so much more Mm -hmm. when I watched it again, like, more closely. I always loved her character, but this time I was, like, really soaking in some of those details. Which I think, you know, I tend to do that. Like, I tend to have favorite shows that I'll rewatch, and then I'll, like, really soak in some of those juicy details where the performer is just, like... Things that you might not notice the first go around, but the second or the third go around, you're like, wow, that was really amazing yeah. what they just did. Yeah, that's always great when when uh, that happens. It doesn't happen a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I thought the same thing with her again, like watching her. I forget what schools she went to, if she even went to school. But she was friends with a lot of really powerful, strong actors like herself. But she obviously loved it because she taught it, I believe. And I think she followed through with her, how she treated people in a, you know, the best way with her performances in terms of the human heart, you know, and like, you know, reacting to situations. And I think she was married a few times, but uh, Jack Klugman, who was in Quincy, the TV series, the detect, the mm-hmm. doctor detective, I think they were good friends. Yeah. And her sister Renee said that um, at the funeral or, you know, like there were all these huge stars you know that she just couldn't believe you know like oh my gosh she said her and her one of you know the other relatives sister or brother or something was like they were you know 
they were at to celebrate Barbara's life there, but at the same time, they were just like blown away by <laughs> all these different mm-hmm. people who obviously really cared about her. Yeah. Yeah, you can find find out more information online about Barbara. Not just from from Renee's Facebook is really good because she even puts mm-hmm. she even puts stuff on. I have the I have the the ice from the strawberry chilled. It's it's now like melting and it's making ah. this popping sound. <laughs> oh, I hear that. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, so it was the same size as hers with the ice and stuff. So I'll, I'll... I love it. That's awesome, <laughs> Paul. Good job. But like, I first read a. You can find a thing on IMDb about Barbara, but a lot of it is originally taken from Renee's own words, but the interviewer was Scott Michael, who has a website called www.findadeath.com. And it definitely the dark side of things in a way when you think about it, but but it's mm-hmm. he does like these tours in LA of where people died. Oh wow. But he's really a wonderful writer and researcher. He he's done a bunch of different things, but he contacted Renee and got a lot of the information that you read online now about her. Oh, okay. And I think she, uh, I believe she shared it, shared it with him. Um, but you can also go to the Renee's Facebook page and see a lot about Barbara cool. since they were so close. And- yeah, and we can put all those links in the show notes, so anybody who wants to find out more about Barbara will have the links in the show yeah. notes for you. Okay. So this scene is a second murder, and there isn't always a second murder in a Columbo, but no. in this one there is. I feel like it. Ha- I, I feel like it's happened. I don't know a handful of times in Columbos where there where the murderer kills a you know a second time or whatever. So Lasenka has prepared a beautiful dinner. She's wearing red again mm-hmm. with white polka dots. This beautiful like red chiffon dress, white polka dots, a very high slit in the side. So she's you know showing a little bit of her sex appeal. Ken compliments her cooking, asks her where she learned to cook. I think. Yeah. But she references them that her late husband was a cook for the merchant marines did you yeah, yeah. see this paul apparently yeah, i remember it's it. like a reference to Columbo, peter fox first job oh yeah or one of his former jobs that's right it was like a inside joke about the fact that peter fox served as a cook in the merchant marines i just made that connection i i, I, I knew that but i didn't catch oh, it oh cool yeah i didn't know that about him so i thought that was cute to see a little little inside joke there yeah um so yeah so he ki- he kills her and that's a, it's a little grim we don't normally see i feel like in columbo's well i don't know i guess every now and then you see the victim realizing what's happening but her i feel like her reaction was like even more grim yeah probably because she was such a great performer that they were like let's give her a little more <laughs> you know yeah. airtime here so he does kill her because, you know, he does not want to give her $15,000. He does not want to have, you know, a victim or a, a witness rather to what he's done. And then he rows her out. He, he puts her on a rowboat, rows her out to the middle of the lake, puts her in the, dumps her body in the water and f- the bottles and then flips the rowboat and swims to shore. Yeah. So that's, that's the end of. Lily Lasenka in this episode, yeah. sadly. Yeah, she turns around and screams at the camera. Mm-hmm. But she looks right into the lens, which there's not too much of that going on. Yeah, no, I mean, that's like more like scary movie right mm-hmm. there. That's That might be like Steven Spielberg right there. I think so. <laughs> and then the next morning, we see the scene down by the dock or the little boat launch area of beach where they've discovered her body and her boat ken's gone down this is another creepy part about ken he's gone down to like visit the scene of his crime which you know some i i do follow a little true crime and some real life killers do that they like go back to the scene of the crime because they like i don't know get some pleasure out of it or who knows but he goes back to the scene of the crime in the morning this is where you see all the like you were pointing out earlier just from some of the locals you get the the feeling of the of the area and you hear you sort of overhear conversations that are happening like oh you know it was a a local woman she owned the country store or what or whatever things like that yeah and so he goes back to his cabin columbo surprises him at the cabin i just want to make one fashion fashion comment alert here Ken is wearing these really groovy hip hugger jeans that are kind of low and they kind of flare out in the bell bottom style. And he's got a thick brown belt. And I I think I tried that look for a little while in college. (laughs) (laughs) 
I bet I don't think I pulled it off as well as Ken, <laughs> but I like I like I like that that look there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and then Columbo asks. I thought this was kind of an interesting question, not from a police perspective, but he asks, "Did you know her?" And I, it kind of made me think because Ken's like Columbo. Columbo's talking about like the the death right of this local woman and Mm -hmm. you know yeah miss lasanka and colombo's like did you know her and and he's like no not really and then they talk a little bit more and and colombo's like oh so you did know her and he's like well you know i you know how do you ever really know somebody Mm. it just made me sort of think like oh i wonder like for me personally who who those kinds of people are in my life where i like maybe i would say i don't know them but I I guess I do know them a little bit. I just thought it was kind of an interesting question about like relationships. Like how do you, Yeah. what counts as like knowing somebody versus not really knowing somebody. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I no, know. I think that's a, that's what they always talk about with that kind of stuff. The cliche interviews with the neighbors or whatever. It's either they really did know him or they always wondered or, you know, I'm surprised or, I mean, he's talking about himself too. Mm-hmm. What do you really know? You know, like totally, yeah. I mean, he gave her a gift of a book with his signature. Yeah, and I feel like if you give somebody a gift, that your relationship is—it's hard to say that you don't really know somebody. You know, if you kind of go out of your way to give him a personalized gift like that. Yeah, but I mean, he's always doing that for publicity too, and he kind of talks about it that way, like, ah, you know, she's just. Had to give her something, you know, to had, you got to give the public something. Right. It's true. And actually, you know, there are times like for your garbage person, you might put out a gift or I don't know, I guess there are other times. But yeah, definitely for someone like this, where you're promoting yourself, you're going to give out your book yeah. to people that you don't really know. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, authors are doing that all the time, right? They're like, if you buy a copy of my book, I'll send you four signed copies or whatever. Yeah. And he was the publicity guy of the team. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, that's what he knew how to do. Yeah. And then, you know, Ken Franklin has to sneak in another snarky comment to Columbo. He's like, I'd offer you a bathing suit, but you don't really look like the athletic type. (laughs) (laughs) With a cigar in his hand. Oh, my God. Yeah. Pretty funny there. And Columbo does make the comment. It's not snarky. It's just factual that he tried to call ken last night but there was no answer on the phone so all these clues all these little bits of evidence are piling up and then colombo heads out to the country store to mrs lasenka's home which is like behind the country store yeah and he asks the cops if he can like check that was an interesting reveal like i didn't know that yeah me either paul and i think i watched this episode like a couple of times before i realized that her house was behind was like (laughs) part of the country store it took me a while to figure that out which makes you love her even more yeah totally she's like living there living her work and she has the southern bell statues you know on the in her little corner there oh i didn't see those yeah. So Columbo asks for permission from the local sheriffs if he can. He's like, I'm working on a case. Can I come in? And he finds a champagne cork mm-hmm. on her floor, which is interesting because in a much later episode of Columbo, champagne cork, a champagne cork again comes in as a piece of evidence against the murderer, which is interesting. But this is the first episode where we see Columbo's Peugeot. Mm, okay. And we don't get great views of it, but we see it. You see it most clearly here. I think you see like a little corner of it in an earlier scene, but you see like the full car here at the at the country store hmm. where he pulls in. Oh, you know what? He is looking when he gets the book, prescription murder book. Uh-huh. There's a sign that says rifle range behind it. So there must that rifle range that I saw when I was in Big Bear and heard. Uh-huh. It must be. I wonder if it's the same one. Ah. Uh-huh. Interesting, probably. So we're almost at the end here. So Columbo, you know, he finds the champagne cork. And then the next scene is back at Jim's house, or Jim and Joanna's house, the Ferris house. And Columbo's talking to Joanna. He's trying to convince her that Ken killed Jim, which upsets her. Well, she's a little bit upset and he raises his voice a little bit. She's like, he's like, I don't care how long you've known this man. Mm -hmm. He killed your husband. You need to see this. Yeah. He needs her help to think about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So she's kind of angry, but she's like, well, what do you want me to do? I'll do my best. And this is where Columbo finds a little, he, he needs matches. And when he opens the match, 
book, he sees a little plot line, like a two sentence plot line about Jack and Jill was written inside the match book, which is just bananas to think about. If you're an author, you're writing your story ideas on like little scraps of paper all over your home. Like, I don't know how you're going to... I've read that with writers. Uh, I don't know if it was Neil Simon or Woody Allen or both of them, but that that they would do that. And I, I've done a little bit of that. I mean, I'm not, like you know, writers like them, but that's, uh, I think, not uncommon, at least back then. But then how do you go back and see and, and see your ideas? Well, you don't want to forget the idea, so that's why you write down whatever you can find. Uh-huh. So it's... But then if you put it on a matchbook that's in a random spot in your living room, like, how are you ever going to find it again? The phone rings. Uh-huh. Or Joanna says, hey, sweet, can you get this really quick? And then you're just, you're off to do the next task that you, and then you've forgotten about it. Leaving stuff different places. I mean, I'm guilty of that here at our place. I have multiple sheets. I have, if I rent a movie... I'll have a, I have a list for it. And the reason I keep the list, so like I have a list from Videotech, this video store down the street, and I rented whatever happened to Aunt Alice, the outfit, Black Eye. And so I keep this, I kept this for our show, but I also keep it to write a review for myself because I have, I write reviews of stuff so I can remember what I liked about it and it helps me with my own writing when I'm writing a script or a, or an idea for something, for, for acting or something else series or something character for an acting role but i understand what you're saying too it does seem odd i I mean i totally see writing it down but it just feels like i don't know how he's going to come back to that little matchbook like how will he find his little note that he wrote in that yeah one little spot i guess well that's a good point because then that's how william link or no stephen bochco i should say that's how he thought like well how am i gonna how's how would columbo discover this yeah didn't he need a match from her? Yep. Is that what he asked? Yep. He asked for a light and she handed, she opened the box. She had like a little box, little metal box of matchbooks. Yeah. So maybe there's the disconnect in writing. That's very convenient that he, that, that, that is left there, mm-hmm. but it helps the, the narrative move. Definitely. Because now it's like, oh, so he writes a lot of stuff like this. So for instance, when Ken Franklin goes to the grocery store, in order to be avoid being seen with Jim Ferris, why would he go to the grocery store? Why wouldn't he just go straight to the place? Totally. Well, it's because he needed to make a call that wasn't traceable, right? Yeah. And he needed to call the wife without Jim knowing. So where else could he go but there? I mean, he technically could have gone to a place along the road, which, but, but I bet Jim would have felt that was odd. Yeah. So so he goes into the store, and then she sees, she decides to go do her own peeking. But if he had never gone there, she would have never looked and and had you know yep. this whole this whole storyline developed. So so the writer Bochco had to write that reason for him to go into the store. Now that reason kind of works, mm-hmm. but the reason for picking up the matchbooks right there in the same place kind of doesn't work. It's not terrible. Yeah. But it could have been more clever, like, what's all these scraps of writing up here on the fireplace? If Columbo asked Joanna that. Right. That would have been more, a little more natural, right? Yeah. So, but then it's very distinct, you know, because then he's about to light and he looks at it. What's this, you know? Totally. Yeah, it's a key moment there. So, he, I mean, that really helps him nail Franklin. Yeah, and this is the scene where I was saying, like, I didn't, I didn't quite, one of the scenes, scenes with Joanna, I didn't quite buy her completely i don't know exactly what it was but i felt like there was something not quite convincing maybe not enough hard or i don't know what it was in that moment yeah it's a little yeah i would have put um so when i look at the credit list on imdb Mm -hmm. i had felt that rosemary would be more in the tv show than barbara colby but i don't think she is oh because of her yeah no she has just a couple scenes yeah so i was a little misled in some ways too because i was thinking she was being much more prominent but Barbara just kind of steals the show. But that could have been the editing, too. That's true. So that could have been a combination of John Kaufman Jr. editing and Spielberg helping him or looking at it, or the producers in general, William Link and Richard Levinson, and saying, God, we've got to have more Barbara in there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, it's true. I don't know how much you know extra they would shoot for these things. So that'd be interesting to find out. Totally. There's got to be some extra. It doesn't doesn't make the cut. Mm-hmm. The the only set point I wanted to point out here was the wallpaper mm-hmm. in this room. 
in the Ferris home is so pretty. It's like mm. white wallpaper. It has all these like bushy green. It kind of like bushy green trees all over it. It's just kind of cool little 70s detail. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't notice it until now, until you said it. So then we're at the final scene. Back at the office, Columbo. Well, first off, Franklin pulls up to his office. He sees the moving van and he asks the mover, you know, you guys all done in there? And the mover has this like 50s Hollywood cop voice. You can probably do that, Paul. (laughs) Can you do his voice? I'm only the driver. Yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's, It's classic, like, Hollywood. I'm only a driver. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he, sa- he sounds very, um, got an accent from somewhere. Yeah, I love it. New York or something. Totally. But I feel like that New Yorker accent is in all the like movies of this era. Like, I don't know. Well, probably, yeah, they, people came out, you know, from all over wanting to get in pictures and... <laughs> If you had a, you know, distinct, and then probably a lot of people who came over from the country, their their parents still had the accent or the neighborhood they grew up in. Totally. You know, you had a lot of Bronx, like Patty Chayefsky, the screenwriter, he had a real thick sort of a Bronx accent, sounded like. And the Jake LaMotta, the, the famous boxer that De Niro played, he had a, he was from the Bronx. He has a very specific, it's, you know, it's different than other areas in New York or the, the boroughs. Mm. Yeah. But it's it, it's fun to hear and watch, you know. Totally, yeah, I love it. I love accents, all accents. So it's, yeah, so it's probably part of the reason they got cast. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Because it's like, oh, this is this is reality. Like, there, this is someone from you know here or there. Yeah. So yeah, so this is the final scene. Ken Franklin realizes his office hasn't been emptied yet, so he goes up to find out what's the delay. He finds Columbo sitting at his desk, reading one of his books, and he's so pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and But Columbo, this is where Columbo, this is the gotcha. He's like, I found, well, he, Columbo has other stuff, but the, the punchline is Columbo's like, I found this slip of paper with the plot line, and he like reads back to him the plot line for a book, which is the the way that Jim was killed. And so Columbo's like, that's enough evidence to lock you up, which I'm like, yeah, is it? I don't know. Like, that seems like a stretch. Yeah, because he just kind of, because you know, Ken Franklin just gives it up. Yeah, he just gives it up. And you're kind of like, hmm. But if he did, if it is like step by step by the book, by these, these major points, the odds of that can't be too good. Yeah. So that would make people really think. It would. But if it would actually be enough to lock somebody up, I don't know. So why? Oh, right. Nowadays. Yeah. So why did he kill his partner? Was he was just so upset that they were, he was not going to be a part of the deal anymore? I think it was two things. Yeah. One was his ego was upset that Jim would go on. So Jim was the true writer of the writing team. Right. Right. So one thing was that Jim was going to go on and keep writing and Ken realized like, oh, I'm not going to keep writing because I am not a good writer. Yeah. So he was worried that everyone would figure out that actually he was not a good writer and Jim did all the writing. But then the other thing was the life insurance. Well, I guess they're combined, right? So Ken can't write, so he can't create income. And they had a life insurance policy on each other that was really big that would help Ken cover all of his super lavish lifestyle expenses like two homes and okay like famous artists in his home and right you know just living very expensive why would franklin get the insurance and not joanna ferris well joanna probably had insurance on her husband too but ken took out a policy on jim because they were partners so it was like a business partner insurance so like if i lose my business partner i don't lose all my income kind of insurance oh i didn't know you could do that yeah i guess you can so that'd be yeah that'd be a big thing right there for the detectives totally i think he might have he probably said that that's like standard that you usually insure your partner but i don't know yeah i remember him saying something about his wife getting money i didn't get to watch it again this time around like i just watched it a long time ago and then i watched it again a few days ago so one quick thing i want to say about when he first walks into the office and he gets off the elevator the cops turn around and look at him kind of like you're in trouble (laughs) then a third cop appears in the middle of the screen it's very that would be a spielberg move i bet or maybe it was him and the camera guy i totally noticed that it was like 
Yeah. Yeah. That was cool. One other really sort of uh, interesting thing about this episode is that, so it's called Murder by the Book, right? So it's sort of like it's already been written in a way. Yeah. I, I recently watched an interview with Peter Falk, just the beginning of it. And it was him at the actor's studio. And the interview that he had was with the, that famous guy that Will Ferrell makes fun of. Uh-huh. And supposedly that room was the same room that Peter Falk had been in years ago. But it wasn't like for acting. It was for social services or something else. Something that he studied. I forget what. But the interviewer asked him to tell us about high school. And Peter Falk said he was the president of his class in high school. And he said there was a play going on. And one of his buddies got sick and asked if he would do the part. And he had never, I don't think he had done any acting. I don't think, or maybe he had, but he didn't want to do, he wasn't in the play. Yeah. So the part that he got was a detective. Mm. And that I think was the first, one of the first roles he ever played, but it was a student was sick and just asked him to fill in. So, and then in this episode, uh, we, we mentioned Barbara, unfortunately was shot in real life. Jack Cassidy did an episode which William Link and Richard Levinson used to write for uh, the Ellery Queen magazine, and they also wrote for the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Cassidy was in an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, and in this one, it's called The Photographer and the Undertaker. It's really good. Really, really smart. Mm -hmm. Jack Cassidy plays a hitman who also has a cover business as photographer. I won't, I won't say much, but in this episode, he makes it look like his character burns in a fire. Uh -huh. And in real life, that's unfortunately what happened to Jack Cassidy. Oh, wow. Yeah, he burned. He drank too much, and he was smoking cigarettes, and I guess the cigarette burned the couch, and, and uh, he died. Burned his apartment down. Oh, that's sad. Wow. Yeah, it's just sort of odd coincidences, you know, in, yeah, in, in a way, totally. when, when you think about, you know, going back to Barbara Colby's idea that what her sister said, that for the rest of the world, this seems... For the rest... So... For her, for Barbara, this was her fate. And for the rest of the world, this was random. Something like that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So it would go back to the idea of it's it's already been written, right? So it's written yeah. in the stars, so to speak. But anyway, yeah, it's very, and then just like the idea of Spielberg and then Steven Bochco, it's really interesting. Just, to, just a really interesting episode. It's a good one. Now it's time for our rating of this week's episode of Columbo. Before we do that, Paul, this makes me want to tell you, don't take any roles where you're killed, please. Okay? <laughs> I think I've done that already, though. I, I, oh, no! Yeah, I didn't know I was going to be oh. killed, but we, they decided to have me shot, so... Don't do that again, okay? That's it. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, i got to play one where I, like help people you know there you go i gotta be, i gotta reach out and help a lot of people oh my gosh okay yeah so i would have to say that this is probably one of my favorite columbos i'm gonna give it a nine and a half out of ten because it has so much of what i love about columbo it has just little snippets of humor these little comments from ken franklin at Columbo, little moments. It has Lily Lysenka, who is amazing. And it has some really beautiful locations. Mm -hmm. The Big Bear, being up in the Big Bear and the cabin. And then even the even Ken Franklin's home and the view of the city. It doesn't have a ton of like glamorous costumes like some of the other episodes. But I think it has, It's that is made up for by Barbara Colby's performance. I think Jack Cassidy makes a really good... He's a really good villain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'd say this is one of my favorite. I, I got to give it a high rating. It's one of my faves for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Jack Cassidy, I think everyone agrees, is fierce and powerhouse. Yeah, I, I, I want to give it an eight and a half maybe. I, I want to give it more, but I just, it's such a, uh, feels a little heavy for me. <laughs> uh -huh. And I, I think it's because I liked Barbara so much yeah. yeah totally. you know and it's sort of like this sort of I remember this one but I yeah I think I'm sort of torn between eight and a half and nine. yeah I don't have to decide right no yeah. you don't I mean also yeah you're right like the way that I think probably Spielberg directed it makes it 
feel maybe even a little more heavy than some of the other ones. I don't know if that. Yeah. He makes it very real, like yeah. kind of, or tries, you know, he's really getting in there. Like when she turns around and screams and covers herself, yeah. you know, she's totally. like, no, yeah. I didn't want this to happen. <laughs> I know that that is a bummer moment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess there's just those people like Cassidy who think that they can get away with it with all this stuff. But and, and saying like, oh, you should read my books, you know. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. But that, that just seems like he's really missing a big chunk in his head of reality. I think there's a lot of people like that. But that's why he would do something like that, right? Right. Well, Paul, do you have a little trivia, true, false quiz for me this week? I sure do. All right. Are you, re- are you ready for this one? Yes. Jack Cassie had two kids, and two of his kids are very famous. One is David Cassidy, who was in the Partridge family, and had a, had another kid named Sean Cassidy. Um, both Sean and David were did tours, like singing tours, I believe. Not together, I don't think. Sean actually still produces stuff now. He's a real big producer. But he, Sean Cassidy was like on the front of Dynamite magazine, which was this magazine that our older brother, Sean, used to get. <laughs> but David Cassidy was really huge, as was Sean Cassidy. And they were both the sons of Jack, two different moms. So both of these sons actually came to one of my films in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We used to do, when I was in, in college at the University of Alabama, I was the program director for a year programming the films. I don't know if you, do you remember that? Or did I ever tell you that? Yeah. yeah. I do remember that. So I programmed two semesters, one year of films for the students to come watch. So I was given a little bit of money of the student fees. And there was something that they always did before I started. And that was a the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And that's, you know, a famous movie. And so we have performances and stuff. And so on one of those screenings, the brothers were there together. And they watched the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Well, I helped program, I should say. I was the director that year so you're saying that both brothers came to a night of your programming at the university of alabama rocky horror picture show i don't know paul i feel like i heard a little smile in your voice and i feel like maybe only one of the brothers came (laughs) i'm gonna say that was false what one of the brothers came that's my that's what i'm that's what i'm claiming (laughs) am i right you're right you're right. Ah, yes. One of the brothers came. I wasn't there that night, but one of the actors who was who performed, because they would perform live. For the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yeah. Yeah, we would have like actors, and it was a real mess to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of those things. But but if you if you worked it, you would have, I think everybody who was in the film program would have to work it. Hilarious. Uh, for the films committee, rather. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. One of the actors who was in it, who played Frank Inferner, he told me he met one of the Cassidys. I think, I, I don't know which one it was. It might've been David Cassidy. Oh, Paul, you, you got to figure out which one it was. Yeah. I've never, I hadn't talked to this guy since, so I don't know. But yeah, it was, I always thought it was Sean Cassidy. I know, I think David lived in Florida. So that would make sense why he, David's passed on. Sean's still producing wow. stuff. He's, he's like American Gothic, oh, the TV yeah. show. He's a show cool. showrunner. Yeah, he's huge. Awesome. Yeah, that was that was pretty good, Liz. I don't know if I can fool you. <laughs> Keep trying, Paul. <laughs> I, I, you, I'm sure you can. <laughs> well, that's it for this week's episode of Trench Coat Cigar Peugeot Wandering with Columbo. We'd like to thank Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to add to our conversation, you can email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com or reach out to us on Instagram at trenchcoatcigar. Paul, I've got just one more thing, Paul. What? Thanks for listening.